Yeah, well, it's it's the the crises that we're in the midst of currently. Speaking as someone here in the U.S., I mean, we can talk about the pandemic. We can talk about the political situation. I mean, all of these different things, and it seems that. I actually want to touch on something. I mean, this, sure. this when we talked about potentially doing this as a collaborative thing with Tata, yeah. um, something that I was looking at with both of your uh, lectures and conversations that you both had as you touch on cultural somatics mm-hmm. and the animus perspective of, you know, I, I think of the United States as being like a, a living body. It's a culture. Yes. It's a living thing. And it may, Absolutely. it's a destructive thing, in my my opinion, ultimately. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it is not nourishing. It seems like it takes more than it gives. Yep. Um, especially now. Um, yep. And it seems like the people that were the main beneficiaries of, of, I guess, paying tribute to this living being called the United States, which I would define as white people, yep. uh, they're not getting anything out of it anymore, not nearly as, mu- as much as they used to. So there seems to be, when you yep. talked about insecure attachment and all of these things that just sort of resonated with thinking about fascism and authoritarianism and the desire for the strong man to come in and fix these things and to bring us back to a glorious day, you know, make America great again. And all of this, like all of it just screams trauma. Yep. And the unfortunate thing, is not just like white people are the victims here. They're the ones perpetuating violence by engaging in this kind of Yep. insecure attachment relationship with the living body that is the United States. Yes. So, yeah, I guess this idea when you're talking about connecting with the ancestors and only going back 300 years and then stopping, I'm thinking about white people in particular that are enamored with white supremacist ideas and that sort of, um, you know, because yeah. in a way, actually white supremacism does attempt in a very half-assed kind of way to connect yep. white people to their ancestry Absolutely. But it stops. It stops at this magical, mythical white nation that, you know, existed hundreds of years ago that we need to reclaim and bring back. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. I just want to get your thoughts on how, you know, fascism, white supremacy, the United States as a white supremacist project is, um, I guess, in a way, kind of trying to fulfill what you just totally. discussed there, but it's yeah. not never able to fulfill it in the fullest sense because it's a it's a traumatizing relationship, I think, or it's an yeah, insecure absolutely. relationship. So anyway, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a catch-22. It's a catch-22 because even if white people get what they want, they still won't be satisfied. That's the reality of the nervous system. It's mm-hmm. like the nervous system, even if it thinks that it's gotten what it wanted, sometimes can trick you. So here's the deal with trauma, right? Trauma is unintegrated resource. So we have all of this new or, you know, new old information like, you know, white men doing neurological research basically and saying like, oh, the body remembers everything and all of this, like the body tells tells you things about unconscious, you know, uh, things that are still kicking around in your system that haven't been resolved. That's all very good and true, but the body doesn't tell you the sort of like truthiest truth that it could tell you it tells you its interpretation of the truth Mm. that is sort of like based on your culture your heritage your how you were raised so it tells you this kind of like simulation of something that is like a signal through multiple radio towers or something right Mm -hmm. Every time it hits a radio tower it kind of the message kind of gets a little fuzzier or a little stranger and then it reaches you and you're like oh how do i decipher this message right Now, all of us have this experience. We all have some fucking behavior that we do, that we don't want to do, that we are doing even when we don't want to fucking do it and we can't seem to stop it. Yeah. Every single person has it, whether it's binge eating or biting your nails or like watching porn too much or scrolling Facebook. There's some freaking behavior that we're just like, why does my body do this thing that doesn't actually make me feel good? Yeah. So I think that on a large level, if we take the American body as a sort of super body, you know, a bigger body, Mm -hmm. and it has a bigger nervous system, I think fascism is one of those fucking behaviors that we are like, why the hell is this seem like an option? 
Yeah. This isn't helping anybody. It's not even helping the fascists. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So this is what I really think is that if we get down into our own guts about the benefits of our defensive automatic mechanisms and behaviors, like to actually go, what is the benefit of me chronically biting my nails? Or what is the benefit of me binge eating this ice cream because I just suddenly got really, 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 really weirdly hungry at 8 p.m.? Mm -hmm. Like if we get to the core of those questions, that's where our experience and our ancestors' unresolved experiences sort of meet and crystallize in a behavior that is defensive and is trying to tell us something but in such a really kind of annoying way. Mm. It's like, are you really hungry for ice cream or do you re are you really just sad about something? Yeah. Or are you really just angry about something? Like, these are the kinds of questions that I think we need to be asking about things like fascism. And that's not just fat white supremacist fascism. I'm talking about the neurological the neurological compulsion to control everything and everyone around you. Yeah. That's what fascism and narcissism actually are. And we see it, if we start to take it away from the identity politics, like, yes, fascism is terrible. And I'm not saying it's not, I'm saying that like, we need to stop that shit because that's fucked up and people are dying and it's not okay. But we can also see fascist tendencies in ourselves we can see fascist tendencies in our families and our friends where something starts to become so over threshold or over stimulating that we clamp down, we brace, and we try to control everyone and everything around us in order to not feel this feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm really saying that we have to work on all these levels and all these scales we can't think that we're healed of fascism when we go and try to heal the country of fascism because that also is dissociation. Hmm. I'm not saying they're the same effect. I'm not saying they have the same impact. The fascism that I have in my life is nowhere near as bad as some of the fascism I'm seeing on the news. That's not the same impact. However, it's the same pattern in a different fractal of the body. It's still hyper control based on fear and discomfort and a kind of pain that we can't really name and we don't really want to talk about it. Right? Yeah. And so imagine, I imagine a political social dialogue in which people could actually feel safe enough to talk about what they really are feeling rather than the sort of masks that they're putting on for the kind of like, you know, you know, make America great again is a super great example of this mask because on the surface level, it doesn't really sound that bad. Right. Like as a, as a kind of like poetic spell, make, make X great again. Hey, I want to make me great again. I want to make my mom great again. Like whatever, like, sure. Yeah. Like, but when you realize it's still distracting from the actual thing, which is like, what is so fucking painful that you think you need to make something great again? What happened in your nervous system that made you feel like you needed that kind of spell to cast? Hmm. What is still happening in your nervous system that you don't dare talk about because if you talk about it, somebody will disown you or somebody will threaten you with violence or exile. These are the things that are happening at the kitchen table of families across this country. This is where fascism actually starts. It's in the fact that there's a child who isn't being heard, who has inherited ancestral trauma and needs an outlet and they go out. And they find this weird fucking gang that loves them temporarily and in this very strange way, but it's better than being ignored. And suddenly that's a white supremacist. Yeah. That person didn't, that person didn't pop out of the womb being like Heil Hitler. Nobody does that. 
But there's a tendency for generations to pass down the unhealed trauma, and those tendencies could be like a susceptibility to fascism or cult dynamics. Right. Yeah. Just like I had a susceptibility to eating gluten and causing my fucking intestines to start to fall apart. I just developed some kind of, I just was inherited some kind of weird deficiency. And if I, if someone had told me earlier, I might have avoided a lot of trouble. Yeah. But we have to start talking. I think we have to start. I, 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 I understand that, like, I'm trying to give a lot of information and it sound it might sound very cognitive to people listening and it might sound cognitive to you. And the reason that I'm doing that is that the education in our country is so impoverished. It's I gr- I grew up in it. I grew up in white public school culture and I didn't learn any of this. I had to take my whole adult life. I'm 40, I'm about to be 41 years old now. And I'm like, wow, I finally feel like I have some beginning of life happening. Mm. And it took four fucking decades because our culture is so fucking remedial when it comes to basic, basic human nature. And I just think we have to start to, that education process has to start with all of us sort of learning and being able to talk about it in various ways to various people who are in various stages of development. Because I'm talking to you this way, but if I was in front of someone who was like, let's say, a heroin addict and really, really beat up, and I would have to do something. I would have to tell them the same thing that I'm telling you in a very different way. Yeah. Because they just couldn't hear all of it in a certain way, and it wouldn't make any sense, and it wouldn't be be useful for where they're at. So I do understand that the way that I'm talking is not for every situation. But as a kind of educational, like kind of uh, olive branch, I really want people to feel what I'm saying and try it on for themselves and start to like play with it so that they might actually go, oh my gosh, there is, there's, there's actually something that kind of might be like hopeful over here. It doesn't mean that the problems are going to go away. But what it does mean is that you don't have to be stuck in the swamp that you inherited. You could actually climb out of it and say, well, what am I going to do with this swamp? Rather than drown every two days because you don't even realize you are in a swamp and that you have inherited it. (laughs) 